Hi again, everybody, and welcome to another meeting of the Northern New England chapter of Sabre. We always hold our meetings in conjunction with the Gardner Waterman chapter up in Vermont, Dr. Clayton Trudor, chair. Tonight, ladies and gentlemen, we have a very, very special guest up here in Northern New England. Rupert Jones is an 11 year Major League Baseball veteran, a two time Major League Baseball All Star outfielder, and a World Series champion. He came from nothing to fulfill his dream of playing Major League Baseball and battled injuries throughout his career, but repeatedly bounced back stronger. Now, in 1980, Rupert collided with the outfield wall while chasing down a fly ball. The result was a traumatic brain injury that went undiagnosed for over 30 years. During this time, his personality changed. He turned to drugs and alcohol. He flirted with suicide. His life spiraled out of control and he lost his family and friends, but Rupert never gave up. His story is about a search for answers during a time when there were no answers. Rupert's story is more common today than ever. My house, I know it with my wife. Though now the effects of traumatic brain injuries and CTE are very, very well known. Athletes are doing everything possible these days to prevent head injuries. And some of that goes back to Rupert's experience years ago. The story of Rupert Jones is not just an athlete's memoir. It's a story intended to help those who have suffered a similar fate and don't understand what's happening to them. And it's my pleasure and it's my honor to introduce to Northern New England, former Major League Baseball great, Rupert Jones. Rupert, welcome to Northern New England, my friend. How are you this evening? Well, thank you very much. I got to ask you a question. Lay did on you me. have that speech written down or did you memorize it? No, I had that <laughs> on my screen at the same time. You think I can't memorize my own name, my friend. <laughs> uh, your wife, your wife, she had she had a brain injury and she, she says she has light sensitivity. Yeah, that is correct. That is correct. Okay. And uh, how long ago, how long ago was this? Molly? Um, it was 20, I think it was about five years ago now. Okay. Mm. Chances um, are you got, chances are you got, uh, you got some kind of answers right away as to the effects of what your head injury did to you. Yeah. So we went to a walk-in clinic initially and they thought that I just kind of got a, um, like a mild concussion and they gave me um, some anti-nausea medicine and told me to take Motrin or Tylenol as needed. And when a week passed and there was literally nothing getting better and I was still dizzy just trying to get out of bed, we went to the GP and um, initially they did do a CAT scan and everything looked fine. And then I saw the GP and they did another CAT scan and um, I saw my GP for about weekly for a month and nothing was improving. And they gave me some different medicine for the headaches. Um, one of them was a barbiturate and they um, needed to get me off of it, but they couldn't get the headaches under control and the photophobia just wouldn't relent. It was like I was, um, living in the house of vampires. We had these blackout curtains so that I could just be around the kids. And um, going outside, Bruce bought me this beautiful purple umbrella and I had a big sun hat and shades and everything just so I could function. And um, it was just exhausting for me. I, I would get the kids to school, I'd come home and sleep and just trying to function was exhausting for me. I couldn't read a book. I couldn't watch TV. Um, during the time I was recovering from my concussions, they had the live theater production on TV of Rent. And that's a very special theater production for Bruce. And I wanted to watch it, but I couldn't. So I sat next to him with a blindfold on so I could at least listen to it. Um, and that was my life for a good year. Did, did you did you ever see the movie Concussion? No, I haven't seen the movie Concussion. I highly recommend the movie. I highly recommend it. Thank you. I appreciate it. Uh, 
you know, what you experience is, you know, again, like I said before, head injuries vary from person to person. I really still don't quite know what I experienced as far as my symptoms are concerned. I just know I had mental issues for a long time. Uh, couldn't sleep, can't sleep, still can't sleep. I had to, you know, when I first, when I first couldn't sleep, I didn't know what to do. I didn't know how to handle it. And so consequently, I was very destructive. And uh, as time grew on, I start. I, I had to change my life. I, had, you know, of course, when, you know, in the book. This was the book, guys. So Never you, can get it, you, you can get it on. Uh, you can get it on Amazon. It's the only place you can get it. But I, uh, I had to learn how to live with it, and I, I searched for answers for years. You know. Imagine you knew your situation, so it, that's a little better. I didn't know what I, what I was experiencing. I just knew I was experiencing something that was not me. So Rupert, can I ask you a question? Yes. When you had that collision, I'm assuming the team doctor checked you out? I went to the hospital. I was in the hospital for a week. Okay. I, uh, I broke my shoulder. I broke my clavicle also. Okay. Okay, now, when I went to the... When I went to the, uh, it's, it's funny you say that. I only remember two things that day. I remember, I remember talking to Tommy John before the game about a, a certain hitter, and that particular hitter, actually the one that I was talking to him about, is how I got hurt. He hit the ball where I where I thought I should be, but Tommy wanted me to play. Tommy wanted me in another position. Tony Ernest. So, so 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 consequently, I got I got hurt in the first inning. I remember Tony Armors coming to the plate and I woke up in the hospital 12 hours later. Okay. August 25th, 1980, wasn't it? I have, I, I, do, I do have some memory issues and I had some blackout issues. So my, you know, my issues were, 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 were they, they slowly over time got worse and worse. Yeah, I have memory issues too. And I also lost consciousness for about 15 minutes when they recreated my timeline from what they can gather. I actually stopped breathing for, 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 for a period of time. Okay. Wow. And I didn't learn this until 30 years later that I had stopped breathing. Uh, as a matter of fact, the trainer who was Gene Monahan, he's, you know, he, he, when, when he retired, he actually wrote a, uh, they, they did a newspaper article on him and they asked him what was the worst injury he had ever attended to. And he said, Rupert Jones. He said he ran into a wall chasing a, chasing a fly ball and he, 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 went, he, you know, he went unconscious. But before we can get him off the field, we had to get him to breathing again because he, had stopped, he actually had stopped breathing. So again, I, I, I suffered, you know, I, I, I dealt with that also. Jesus. Right. Let's, let's talk a little bit about your career. You started out in the Royals organization, right? Yes, sir. I did. Give me a little uh, background on, on your time with the Royals and how, you know, your road to Major League Baseball. The Kansas City Royals, they drafted me out of high school, third round. Uh, they taught me how to play baseball. For three years, I you know I was in the system. Three three and a half years, I was in the, the system, and they taught me how to play baseball. It's a great day for baseball here in PNC. All right, somebody PNC. Got, somebody got Athletics themselves. against the Pirates will line up this way for more say We got a dog here too. Yes, Note at first base. I'm going to mute a couple of people. That go on, my friend. So they taught me how to play baseball. Uh, I went to rookie ball. I went to class A, I went to class AAA, I went to, and I played AAA two years. The second year in AAA, I got called up to the big leagues August 1st, 1976. Uh, I really didn't want to go to the big leagues, if you believe it or not. Uh, really? I, want, I want to stay in AAA. I was having fun. We was in first place. We were winning ball games. And I'm, I figured if I went to the big leagues, I wasn't going to play anyway. So why go to the big leagues and sit on the bench where I could play in AAA and, and and uh, you know, win a championship. Plus, I had an outside chance of winning the most valuable player in the league. And all these things, you know, was, was important to me at the time. But I got called to the big leagues and I played. First day I played, uh, I faced Gaylord Perry. First game, 
Kayla Perry. I got a base hit. I hit the ball pretty good. I got robbed of an extra base hit later in the game. And uh funny thing happened. I didn't start a game for another week. Next game I played was against Goose Gossage in Chicago. <laughs> I got a triple against Goose and uh, I knocked a run in. And I, funny thing happened. I didn't play again for another week. And we went to Cleveland. These were the days. Yeah, I went to Cleveland. I started the game in Cleveland against Dennis Eckersley. Okay. I got a base hit off Dennis Eckersley and I hadn't played in a week. So I was, you know, I hadn't, I hadn't started the game at least. And then my, I didn't play again for another week as far as starting the game. And I started against Burt Blylevin. So I played against Burt Blylevin. I played against Dennis Eckersley. I played against Gaylord Perry. And I played against Goose Gossage. Started those four games. And I knew something was funny at the time because I said to myself, these guys are pretty special. These are, these are awesome pitchers. Well, fast forward now, you look at them, and they're all in the Hall of Fame, all four of them. So that was my first four starts in the big leagues. Uh, That's one way to get started. Jeez. Yeah, no. I got sick. When I got sick in Kansas City also, my tonsils, uh, my tonsils got inflamed. I couldn't swallow. I, I couldn't eat and I couldn't swallow. I was in bed for about five, six days. Ooh. And I lost about 10, 15 pounds. And that was in September. So consequently, you know, basically I had I didn't have a good time there. I didn't, I didn't, in, in, uh, you know, I didn't make any friends there also when I was there. So I got picked up in the expansion draft that year. Seattle Mariners coming to the league that year in Seattle and Toronto. And Seattle drafted first and they took me with the first pick. And I got a chance to play in Seattle for three years. That's the team I most associate you with, Rupert, is the uh, Seattle Mariners. Like you say, you were the number one pick in that expansion draft, Danny Kay. If you look at my I book, recall, if, yep. if you look at my book, my picture, I, I took a picture is with the Mariner uniform on. Yep. Yeah, I, 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 it's funny. I, I, it's, for some reason, I most closely associate you with that club. And I'm an East Coaster. So it kind of tells you, you know, just the, the impact you had in that uniform. I know Danny Kay, if I recall correctly, Danny Kay really wanted you in a Seattle uh, uniform. He wanted you on that club. That's why he grabbed you first. Now, I was very, I was very, I was very honored. And I was happy also because I knew I was gonna get a chance to play baseball in the big leagues. And that was very important to me. At that particular time, playing on a winning team was not the most important thing. The most important thing was getting playing time. Okay, the winning came later. Later in your career, you are, you know, you're looking at winning. But early in the career, you just like to get a chance to play. Now, they loved you up there, right? They, they, didn't they have a nickname for their fans out there for you? Well, they, you know, they called me Roop. Yeah. But that name kind of stuck with me everywhere I went. Except in Detroit, where they called me Rooftop. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> But old Detroit, they 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 love everybody in Detroit. I tell you what, that was one that was one of the best. Uh, that was one of the best ballparks I've ever. That's, that's the best ballpark I've ever been in my life. Yeah, Tiger, Tiger Stadium, Stadium is always always a uh, was always a, a great experience. But what was what was Seattle like for you in those early days of that franchise? Now this is you know you you get drafted number one by the Mariners. You're the first guy to really wear the uniform. And now you're setting foot on a major league baseball diamond for their first ball game. What's that like? Well, you, you, you tested my memory now. That's, that's, that's over 50. That was almost 40, it's 40 some odd years ago, man. You tested my memory. <laughs> but uh, I told you I had, I had memory issues. True. But uh, it, it, it was an exciting time for me. Without a doubt, uh, playing playing in the big leagues and, and starting the opening day was 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 very very important. Uh, it I played 162 games that year, I think, or 160 games that year. I played in almost all the baseball games that year, and I was very fortunate. You know, I was very fortunate to play every day. 
That's good stuff. Yeah, Seattle. I was, all, I was an all star. You know. Hey, I got. An, I, I was an all star there. As a matter of fact, uh, right. when I go back, uh, you know, I went back a few years ago, and my wife, you know, they showed her around the ballpark, and they took her someplace they never took me before. So when I became free, she said, "I got to show you something." So she takes me to the room where the Mariners have pictures all over the walls. And they got a picture, of, they got a life-size picture of me on the wall. And then they got a plaque on the wall with all the all-star members, all-star game members, you know, all-star players. And the pla on the plaque, it says Rupert Jones is the first name on the plaque. You got Ken Griffin, you got Randy Johnson, you got Edgar, Edgar Martinez, you got all the Hall of Fame players, but my name is the first. And I really, yeah, that really, that really, you know, that really resonated with me. That made me feel good. Right. It should. It should. You got, you got there before some of, some of the, some of the greats. That's, yes, that's I a did. great feeling. It's got to be a great feeling, man. Now we've talked a lot already about that night that you crashed into that wall. Um, for those of you tuning in after we started this, my wife, Molly, who's on the call with us tonight, is a survivor of traumatic brain injury. She's been uh, anticipating meeting Rupert now since we decided to uh, uh, do this. And I've appreciated your encouragement for her so far, Rupert. Thank you very much. But you, so you go into that wall in 80. And for lack of better term, it begins to unravel. You played a few more years. It doesn't, you know what? It doesn't unravel right away. It, it, well, unravels over about time. It, it, it unravels over time. You know, you notice things about yourself that, you know, uh, you know, something, you know, you, you notice things a little differently. And then they get progressively worse over time. And they got to the point where they just got really bad. And uh, sleeping was just out of the question. Uh, a lot of other things out of the question. Being able to concentrate and focus for long periods of time was out of the question. Uh, I didn't know. I didn't. I didn't know. Uh, I would drink alcohol to sleep. I would drink myself to sleep so I can go to sleep. Oh. And then it, it got to where the alcohol would I, I'd black out. Okay. I would, I would be, I would be run, I would be conscious, but I would not be aware, aware of what I'm doing. And that could be very, and that, that could be very dangerous. I'm very lucky to be alive to tell the truth. Okay. Because there were many times when I blacked out and I still was function, trying to function. Or I was functioning, but I didn't know what I was doing. And I did, I did a lot of things that, uh, that, 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 that wasn't, what's the word I'm looking for? I'm trying, I'm trying to be political here. I, I didn't, I, I, I did a, a lot of bad, bad things, okay? And of course, those are the things that people remember you by. And then when you tell them that you, you know, all of a sudden now you find out why you was act a certain way. And when you share that, people say, oh, you're just making excuses for, for bad behavior. Well, they don't understand. They don't understand. So they don't want to understand, which is which most important. The they don't want to understand. You just hit the nail on the head. I interrupted you and I apologize for that. Uh, we, we look, I'm going to use athletes specifically because we see this on you know, the sports news frequently these days. A, I'm going to be specific as well. A football player who does something horrible and eventually loses his life, whether that be through his own hand or through the action that happened due to the, the effect of the head injuries and the CTE that he's experienced over the years. The problem that we face in today's sports media, and anybody on this call can correctly, correct me if I'm wrong, it's exactly what Rupert just said. We are focused on the poor behavior and not really what led up to it. In each and every case that at least I'm thinking of, and this goes for, for you know WWE wrestlers and football players, 
um, whoever, whoever it might be these days. CTE is a big deal. Concussions are a big deal. Thankfully, we've taken these protocols over the years and studied these injuries further in an attempt to give these athletes the lives that they deserve after their careers have ended. And I think that's where, and correct me if I'm wrong, Rupert, where you were not taken care of correctly. Well, I, I can't fault anybody because, you know, at that point, 1980, 1980s, you know, basically that was not, that was something that was not even thought of to a certain degree. Yeah. Okay. You know, I'm going to take Molly, for example. Molly, you got cat scans. I saw your little cat behind you, too. That was kind of cute. Oh, cat scan yes. and cat. This is Gus. Gus. He likes Gus, to come to the meeting. <laughs> but uh, they, you know, they've taken cat scans of you and everything, and they still can't find anything, but you know something's wrong. You follow yeah. me? Yeah. So I slipped and fell in our bathtub, and I went temple to temple, and... Yes. The shower was running and I was unconscious for what they think was 15 minutes and I woke up with the water running on me. Yes. And you took CAT scans and you took, if you took an MRI, it probably don't show anything. No, everything came back normal. Um, the, the thing was they couldn't control the headaches and um, they couldn't get the light sensitivity to go down. And I ultimately ended up with an a neurology team that I still have a new neurology team up here since we moved and a neuro ophthalmologist. Yes. And the neuro ophthalmologist, I don't know if you ever experienced it, but that's like a four hour exam. Well, I took a, I took a, I took a neuro evaluation and that was like a five hour, six hour thing. Where yeah. I, I had I, to do that know. too. Yeah. yeah. But, uh, you know, basically, you, you know, you have to, you know, you went through all the bells, you did all the bells and whistles and everything, but they still don't have answers and they won't have answers. Okay. Because the head is, the head is like a computer. Think about the computer. If you put the wrong program in, you're not going to get the right, you're not going to get what you're looking for. Okay. You got to put the right program in to get what you're looking for. Now, if your computer is damaged, you would never be able to get the right information because your computer has a problem. And your brain, when your brain has, when your brain, which is your computer has a problem, then you're going to have a problem because it's going to affect other parts of your personality. Uh, in your, in your case, the vision, you know, you might have, a, you know, I, I know people that, that uh, had head injuries that can't smell. Rupert, it's really interesting that you mentioned about how it's affected me with my vision. I was actually born with a uh, vision impairment but also with um, learning disabilities myself. And because of that, the neurology team felt that my recovery was slowed down because of my learning disabilities and my um, vision impairments. That's because they don't know. So they are making up stuff. <laughs> I said that, yeah. Uh -huh. <clears throat> yeah that, makes sense that. To, that makes sense to everybody. So they make, they make up stuff, but they don't have yeah. answers. Let's go to Mike Ordman here. Mike, you've got a question. Yeah, so Rupert, thank you for sharing tonight. And, and your story, frankly, is my son's story. I think you can see him over my shoulder here. But uh, we adopted three black children at different times okay. years ago. And Greg, 15 years ago, had the first of six concussions, which led to a downward spiral in his life that lasted the better part of a decade. And I'm very proud to tell you that three weeks ago, after 13 years of trying in five different schools, he graduated from college. Great. So the 15 year journey has been wonderful. Um, but along the way, his anger management challenges, which I'm sure you sounds like you experienced too. I had, I had anger management problems. So my question for you is, and I know 1980 is different than 2010, but how much better would the reaction have been from medical professionals for you if you were white and not black? And I will say that in the context of the fact that was what? Sabre, Sabre has been a wonderful organization in advocating to advance the Negro Leagues and black baseball and, and, and getting greater recognition of black players. But 
I also know the journey and the struggles that so many people have been through. So I don't, you know, I don't, I don't fault anybody for my situation. Okay. okay. Because basically I didn't know what was wrong with me. Okay. Right. I couldn't explain it. I couldn't explain it. And I couldn't say, well, I think I'm crazy, but I couldn't explain it. But I knew something was wrong. As a matter of fact, if you, if you read, if you read uh, forward in my book, my wife wrote where uh, uh, one of her girlfriends, we, you know, she, she came to my off, our office and she saw the books that I was reading. I had a whole bookcase of books I was reading. And she looked at all the titles of the book and she said, she said to my wife, he's looking for something, isn't he? He's trying to find the answer to something. And this was back in the late nineties, okay? I read a lot of books. I, you know, a lot of things. I'm trying to figure out what's wrong. I know there's something wrong, but I'm, you know, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm reading books. And then when I finally started going to doctors, just like a Molly, they don't know. Mm -hmm. I took MRIs, you know, and they're all that. They don't know because your brain has so many, I mean, oh, billions of cells in there, man. You got, mm -hmm. you got, you got, you got a neural system that's just out of sight. You got one part and, you know, Right here, back here is where your eyesight, occipital, or your occipital, yeah, where your where your vision is. You got another part, your prefrontal cortex. If you can hit the prefrontal cortex, you might lose your ability to actually do the right thing. That's like little kids, like, like kids, kids, you know, kids. They they, they prefrontal cortex don't really fully develop to a certain amount of time, and you know, say 21, 22 years old. That's why kids. That's why kids make mistakes. But well, adults make them too, though. <laughs> yeah, we do. <laughs> but happened, you know, right? because they, you know, they, you know, and then you got a certain part of your brain is, uh, that 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 that, uh, that controls your reasoning. I mean, the brain has all the functions there. So if if they get if it gets disturbed, you get disturbed. You know, I come, you know, I come to find out I got astigmatism in my right eye. It took years for the, over years for it to happen, but I got astigmatism in my right ear. Well, my right eye is weak, you know, but I used to be 2020. Now the right eye. When I when I started reading back in 1992, 91, 91, I started reading books. I never read books. So I started reading books. The first book I read, it took me a half hour to read one page because my, I couldn't concentrate. I couldn't focus. My mind was always drifting, but I stuck with it and I was able to overcome it. Just like your son, you know, he, you know, yeah, you can't give up. It, you know, you cannot give up. It's easy to give up. You, you, you got so many people on the street today in America, they give up. And yeah. consequently, when you give up, you got no chance. Yep. Okay. So your son is, you know, your son, you be proud, man, because he didn't give I up. <laughs> okay. Well, and like you, his mother, my wife, embarked on a journey of reading and learning more because the establishment wasn't catering to the needs of people like you and people like Greg yeah, that so needed it, it, something it more than just... It doesn't session. matter what color you are. It don't matter what color you are. They just don't know. <laughs> you know, True. they can't help you. True, but their reaction to your anger outbursts is a little different. I mean, he got That's hassled by they don't understand and the ground, handcuffed for things he didn't do, and they I, don't I've heard all that. See, they don't understand it though. That's right. Now, yep. if you know what, I don't care what color you are. If you got some anger problem and, and you out in public and I'm the police, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, you know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna grab you and I'm gonna, I'm gonna. I'm gonna grab you and frisky yeah. or, or put you put you up too. See, mm -hmm. everybody can't go. That's no excuse about you know about that because it's it's just it just it, don't, it if you do the right thing, ain't nothing gonna happen to you. If, if I if, say anything to anybody, if you can if you do the right when you're doing the right thing, regardless of whatever, nothing's gonna happen to you. If you can do the right thing, though, as you pointed out. Yes. Sometimes the brain wrong, injury man. causes you to lose self-control and you can't. And it's hard well, yeah, but what the other what the other person doesn't know that. That's right. That's right. I got this long to think about this, so I gotta I gotta do it now. I can't be thinking, well, this guy might have a hair problem. This guy might not be right. Yeah. It might be too late. It's true. Thank you. Okay. My friend Eric Poulin. Eric, I've known now since I think. 
somewhere around the time Moses parted the Red Sea. <laughs> uh, it's, it's about right, isn't it, Matt? That's a, that's that's about right. Yeah, it's pretty close. That's, pretty that's, close. That's I an mean. accurate assessment. So, right. um, so Rupert, uh, a couple of things I just want to say. Uh, one, I always really appreciated how you played the game. You played hard. I admired your wheels. I, you know, I was I I was a fan of yours. I probably got my first concussion right around the same time that you did, but I was about five or six years old. Uh, I was on playing on one of those uh, merry-go-rounds in the playground. And then all the big kids came in and I flew off of it and hit my head. So I've had about like seven or eight concussions okay. in, my, in my day. And I just want to take a moment and say thank you for your book. And thank you for being so open with how you have addressed the situation. I'm a college professor now. And I for the longest time, I didn't know how to deal with my depression issues with how, you know, like I got knocked in the head when I was a little kid. So I didn't realize that this, the way that I felt wasn't normal. And because of the work of people like you, a lot of that stigma has been broken down. I now tell my students on the first day of every semester that I understand that you might not always feel okay. I have depression issues. Here's what happened to me. I used to joke about it that I was I was highly highly competitive but a shitty athlete. Uh so that's what would happen to me. I would fall I would fall down and hit my head and that's that's what happened playing hockey, taking a line drive off the head, pitching in baseball. It it had such a negative impact on my life and I just wanted to say thank you to you for being so open about your experience and that's made my life and I know the life of many other people easier to navigate. Well, so that's Number you, one, dude. number one, you were able to be honest with your students and, and, and talk to your students in a way that, hey, you know, and that's the, that, the, the, what, the biggest thing is acceptance. I was ashamed of it for the longest time. Yes. I didn't know how to process it. Yes. Uh, now I know because of it's, it's OK to not feel OK and to just acknowledge it and to know that every other people aren't going to feel OK all the time. Yes. So thank you. That's all. You know, I really, happened. really appreciate your work. You know what my definition of depression is? I got a definition of depression. It's listening to the devil. Okay? If you listen to the devil, you will be depressed. Okay? And who talks to you when you're depressed? The devil. Okay? That's fair. All right? And people, they process that and they run that and, and they just rum, they ruminate on that. They ruminate. They ruminate on it. You became a professor, so evidently you were able to to challenge the challenge the challenges you had. You was able to, to overcome them, and you were able to process them and make a positive out of it. And see, that's the it, whole key. It was hard. Hey, everything's hard. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> living's hard. Yeah. Okay, but you made but you process it, and you made and, and and you did well with it. You turned it into a positive. See, and that's the whole key in life. People have to turn their negatives into positives, and you can do that. I, I, you know what? I wouldn't know what to do if everything went well for me. If everything I want to do in this world and everything just came out well, what, I, what would I do? Yeah. I learned from my mistakes. I learned from the things that I did wrong, and I learned from them. But when you have success, you, you know, you kind of like, you, you know, you, you do you learn from it or do you think you're just that good or you just, you know, you, it just comes naturally to you? You know, do you, do, do people actually, you know, you know, do people treat, you know, that's like losing. I, I hate losing more than I like winning. How stupid is that? Can, can I ask kind of a, a, a strange follow-up question, I suppose? So you were teammates in 86 with Donnie Moore. Yes. Which is this? What? Which is I think maybe the saddest story in baseball history. Um, did you ever talk? I mean, I, I realized at that point you didn't quite have the understanding of what you were processing. Uh, I guess I'm just. I've always been really sad, and and I'm a Red Sox fan, so uh, I, won't, I won't hold that against you. Yeah, I was rooting very hard, very much against you. I know you were. <laughs> I know you were. Don't worry uh, about it. But I guess I get, I'm just curious your thoughts about all of that. And okay, just... this is my thoughts about all of that. Okay. 
That's the devil talking to you again. <laughs> you follow me? Yes. You know, you know, because you gave a home run up and it, you know, and it, and, you know, but that didn't lose the game for us. But see, everybody wants to say that lost the game for us. That didn't lose the game for us. We had the bases loaded in the bottom of the ninth inning <laughs> with one out. And the game was tied. And all we needed was a fly ball to the outfield. Sacrifice fly. Okay. So, you know, we, you know, you don't lose a game on one play. That one play might be the outstanding play, don't get me wrong, but still, you don't lose a game on one play. We, you know, in, during the course of the game, there's a many situation where we could have put an extra run on the board here or there. All right, Billy Buck, Bill Buckner. I'm gonna get you a Red Sox fan, Billy Buckner. Okay, we gonna go to the World Series now. Ground ball, easy ground ball go through his, head, through his legs. Bill Buckner is defined by the ground ball that goes through his legs. A lot of people don't know Bill Buckner had about 2,900 hits in the big yeah. leagues, okay? Bill Buckner was hit, had a batting title, won a batting title. He was a great hitter. But they, when you say Bill Buckner, all they think about is the ground ball that went through his legs. Man played on 19, 18, 20 years. Okay? We define him by a ground ball that goes through his legs. I define him by Bill Buckner being a great hitter and a great player for a long time. Yeah. Donnie Moore gives a home run up. Okay? So who start talking to you? The devil? All right. And then he keeps talking to you and you keep listening to him. And pretty soon you get, you, you know, pretty soon you get, you, you, you get blistered. And then people blame you, people fault you everywhere you go, okay? The biggest thing in, in life is to overcome. Okay, what? People, who, people who are successful, they overcome. They overcome. They don't make excuses, they overcome. They don't and blame I, nobody else, and they're not a victim, they, they overcome. And I really appreciate you. I appreciate your, your overcoming and your inspiration to, to all of us. Well, you're inspiration to me, you're a professor. Ah. <laughs> well, I'm gonna go one further here, Rupert. And talk about Eric for just a minute because uh, Eric, Eric's downplaying his achievements within the uh, within our organization. Uh, Eric is spearheading a project which will eventually become a book published by Saber. <clears throat> excuse me, on something called Found Poetry, um, which he is basing off a project that he did called the Found Poetry of uh, Jerry Remy. He presented to this chapter. Jerry Remy. Uh, January, I think it was Eric. Eric. January, yeah. Uh, and th th this has has metamorphosis from this little project that he began to now being a a twenty twenty five book for us, if I recall correctly. It's supposed to be twenty twenty four, but yeah, twenty twenty four, twenty five. I don't remember. <laughs> I. <laughs> I pushed you off a year so you could polish it up, but <laughs> uh, and to elongate that a little bit further, my wife has Eric. Is it two selections in the book? Two. Yep. Two selections in the book. So um, Eric's accomplishments don't just stop at academia. He is a a very well regarded member of our organization and has spearheaded this incredible project and actually done a wonderful job of drawing my wife into the organization after she got started last year at our convention in Baltimore. So yeah, there's that as well. There, I, I think I remember the incident on the playground with the whirly gig. Um, <laughs> As you were one of the big kids, you bastard. <laughs> wow. Well, you know, you just got tossed out of this chapter. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. So that's I think what... I remember that. I remember. Gary Remy, he passed away this year, didn't he? Last year? He passed away. Was it this year? Or last uh, year? He I passed away know. about a year and a half ago. Yeah. What His passing have... was, was what led me to try to. Uh, did he have cancer? Book. Yeah. Did he have cancer? Yeah. yeah, he did, yes. What kind of cancer did he have? 
it was never really disclosed, but he was a heavy <laughs> smoker. It was what? He was a heavy smoker, but it was never really disclosed. Yeah, well, you know what? A lot of people I know, like I got I got another friend who smoked for years and he he's he's battling cancer now. He's battling cancer. Jerry Rimmons, I remember Jerry Rimmons as a second baseman for the Angels. Yep. Then he went to the Red Sox. That's right. He broadcast for how many years? Oh God, Eric, how long did he broadcast for? 30 32, years? 32, I want to say. Oh. You know him and Eckersley. Uh, <laughs> you got you got some beauties in that in that in that. In that <laughs> yeah. Eckersley, Eckersley is a beauty. Eckersley is really good. Yeah, we love the broadcaster. You know why? Eskis, you know why he's good. He cocky. He's always been cocky. So okay. Rupert, at the at the end of their time together, when they were doing a three man booth with Dave O'Brien. There would be multiple times when uh, Eck and Remy would just go off on. Remember that night we were at that disco talking about the time when Eck was probably hitting the bottle a little more than he should have. They were crazy stories. It was definitely very entertaining. Yes. He was a great pitcher, though, man. Oh, yeah. Anyways, I'm going to pause so, to let other people hop on. Yes, please. Anybody. Hop on more. Go for it. Thank you. Uh, yeah, first, uh, thanks, Rupert, for uh, talking to us about the personal subject today. Um, so I have two questions, one serious, one not so serious. But the first question is, uh, so uh, do you have any medical benefits available to you through, like, the Baseball Players Union, or have you tried to pursue that at all? I'm on Social Security, man. And that takes care of your your medical. Um... Oh, my medical, my you know my as far as my mental state is concerned, that is a day in day out process that I go through personally. If you saw what I do on a daily basis, you would say he's monotonous. He's you know, but I uh I I, I try to do games and, and puzzles and stuff to keep my brain going. I go to the gym every day, you know, mm -hmm. four or five times a week. Uh, my wife and I we spend a lot of time together. We do a lot of things together. Uh, my brain, as far as that's concerned, I'm, I'm not going to depend on the doctors, just like uh, with, uh, with, 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 with Bruce's wife. I'm not going to depend on doctors, man, because I, I'm going to do, I'm, what am I going to, I'm, I'm going to depend on them. They don't know. So I got to live with, I got, I got to find a way, I have found a way to function to the best of my abilities. Great. I, I, I have got my, my anger in control. I read my Bible every day. So I listen to God, man. I don't listen to the devil. But I read my Bible every day and I pray a lot. And uh, you know, the anger issues uh are, are are under control now because basically I have better control of myself and I know I know my tendencies now. Before I didn't know my tendencies. A lot of times when, when you know your tendencies and know who you are, you can combat them. You can make you know, make yourself better. And that's what I've done over the course of years. So you're healing yourself. That's great. That makes uh -huh. sense. Oh, it makes a lot of sense. I'm glad to hear it. Um, my second question is, uh, so your first uh, major league at bat, you face Gaylord Perry. Do you throw a spitball at you? <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to tell you my Gaylord Perry story. He passed away recently. Right. I, my first time facing Gaylord, I, you know, I just, I, I, I was, came from the minor leagues. I was, I was, I was playing good in the minor leagues. So I, I was seeing the ball good. And I got up, I told the guys, I'm gonna get a hit the first time up. I don't care who's pitching. It was Gaylord. I got a hit the first time up. The next time up, I hit one off the center field wall and one Bonica jumped up on the wall and caught it. So he robbed me of extra base hits. Uh, during my career, I hit Gaylord pretty good. Okay. I hit, you know, for some reason, I, I saw him good. So I hit him good. Gaylord went to the National League and I was still in the American League. Well, finally, Gaylord and I got back in the same league together. A couple of years later, I hadn't seen him in a couple of years. He had a new pitch he called Puffball. And he would get on the mound and he would bounce the rosin bag in his hand like this up and down about 30 times and get his hand saturated with rosin. And he'd throw the ball and the rosin would come out and he, the ball would come out too. He threw me the Puffball and I hit off the right center field wall. I got the second base. He said, God damn it, Rupert. 
I, you ain't seen me in three years. I got a new pitch, and first time I throw it to you, you hit it. <laughs> but I, I just saw him good. Great. Thank you. Great story. Let's keep the line moving here with Ken Edwards. Thank you, Bruce. Good evening, report. Thanks for sharing your story. Yeah, with old, us. old C. Alapala hat on, huh? Yes, exactly. I don't have a Mariner hat, so I chose to wear a pilot hat, although I am a Red Sox fan. I, I, just like Eric. Were, I won't hold it again. I figured all you guys Many of us are here. I figured all you um, guys are Red Sox fan. Thanks for sharing your story with us. My wife uh, actually had a concussion when she was 12. She hasn't been able to smell since. So that is consistent with what you talked about a half an hour ago. Additionally, uh, a few years ago, she was hit by a car. And so she lives with a head injury. She'll be living with a head injury for the rest of her life. And she has chosen to take that positive path that you've described and just keep going, do her physical therapy, keep her business going. And so thank you for being a, an inspiration on those on those points. It's you great. Tell her, you tell her that all those thing she does it keeps her occupied so she don't sit around and sit around and get in self-pity and listen to the devil again That's right. i know you guys don't mind not believe in it but i'm gonna say to listen to the devil the devil he'll talk to you he'll talk to you and but but she's busy working she's busy doing this and she's doing that but she don't have time so I, will, I will i will tell her that thank you um another question uh, and Eric beat me to the punch with respect to the 1986 ALCS, but I want I want to ask a different a, a question with a different slant, um, and that is your manager Gene Mock. He experienced much heartbreak during his baseball managerial career. Did he follow the belief system that you have talked with us about tonight with respect to learning from adversity and applying? Um, you know, up, applying learnings to the adversity that he experienced as a major league manager. How did how did you experience that, especially would, after the 1986 say, heartbreak? I would say he did. He did learn because he he managed for a long time. You don't get to manage for a long time if you don't if you're not successful. You know, there are times when, you know, you, you know you, your team may not perform up to certain standards and consequently you bear the blunt, brunt. But again, advertisy, you know, some, I got hurt a lot. Some guys, some guys don't even play a whole career and don't get hurt before, you know, one time. I got hurt four or five times. So, you know, it's just, it, it's just, it's just in the cards, man. You know, you just got to play the cards you dealt with. And he he was a good man. He was a great manager, Hall of Fame manager, uh, and he was successful for a long time. Okay, regardless of whatever anybody can say. And see, everybody wants to say, well, he was somebody didn't uh, they they didn't succeed in the big moment. A lot of guys don't get to the big moment. Okay, so you think about that. You know. Thank you. That's it, perfect. It, it, it takes a lot to get to the big moment. That's perfect. Thank you. Thank you for that thought. Okay. I'm glad I'm, I'm sorry. Go, sorry. Go ahead. That's all right. Go ahead. Finish your thought, my friend, I'll, and I'll move on in a minute. Uh, that's it. Next question. Right. Next question. I love these questions. Perfect. Let's go to Susan Nelson. Susan, are you there? Hi. Yeah. Hi, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Um, this is terrific discussion. Um, thank you. Yeah, Rupert, Susan, is it? For uh, for uh, hold on, time out, time out. That's not Susan. Hang on a second. Who's that? That's not Susan. <laughs> no, I I'm, I don't like to see myself on video. So okay, I put my puppy on there. Sorry about that. That's okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, I'm older than you, Rupert. So you know, but I I was an Oakland A's season ticket holder for in the '80s, and I remember you playing very well, and you were a terrific player. Um, I'm very excited. Um, and I'm glad somebody brought up the Donnie Moore story because I just finished reading. I pulled out an old Elysian Fields Quarterly. I don't know if any of you ever heard of it, but it, it was published out of Minneapolis a long time ago. There was an article, a cover article called Donnie Moore, a racial memoir by John Poff, which might be the single best baseball article I have ever read. 
if anybody wants to track it down, um, I can put that in the comments. But my comment, my question for Rupert, it's not, it's on a different subject. And I don't live in the Bay Area anymore, but I know that Rupert, you went to school in Berkeley. Yes. And grew up in that part of the country. And uh, I was, and you mentioned something about how when you first started playing, you were really interested in playing time. Um, and my question is, if you were a player on the Oakland A's, which is on a, on a, I don't know, uh, track to win maybe 30 games this year, uh, the, maybe the worst per season of, of in history, how would you feel if you were one of those players on that team when you pretty much knew you were going to lose all the time? You know what? A player, a player owes it to the fans to play the best to the best of their ability. A player can't go into the game thinking he's going to lose, and you know he's not going to play to the, to the best of his ability. If he if he doesn't play to the best of his ability, he's cheating the fans and he's cheating himself. Uh, when I played, I played to the best of my ability, and whether I, whether you know I didn't figure I didn't you know whether I win, lose, or draw, I just tried to play as hard as I can because people pay hard earned money to come see these games. And they come to see you at least put an effort in. You might lose, but at least put an effort in. Make them think you make them think that you're working hard. Let them know yeah. you're working hard. I think so. I think the fans appreciate that. I think that the issue is that a lot of these players are just not major league caliber. And they they're in there because they're cheap. And to me, that would be really hard on a player to know that they're trying their best. And their best is never going to quite be good enough at that level. Ma'am, I'm going to tell you a secret. Sometimes in life, your best ain't going to be good enough. Okay? It's pretty simple. There's going to there's be time when you're just going to be outmatched. But you still got to do your best. Right. Thank you. If there's, there's 365 days in a year. Oh, man. How many days do you think you overmatched? I hope that I hope that the players are getting that message. Thank you, though. That's a great message. I mean, I, I, I got to say something here, okay? Donnie Moore came up a couple of times. If we don't have Donnie Moore, we don't get to the playoffs. See, that's another way you got to look at things. If Donnie Moore, we don't have Donnie Moore, we don't get to the playoffs. He saved a lot of games for us. He's a big reason why we why we was in the position we was in. And sometimes you, you know, sometimes you get put in a position and sometimes you just don't come through, <laughs> you know, you just don't come through, but that's the, that's the nature of the game. If you came through every time your team would win all the time, your, your team not going to win all the time. Yeah. Thank you. The super Great. point. Paul, Paul Hensler, how are you, my friend? You're up. Hi, Bruce. Thank you very much. And uh, Rupert, it's uh, an honor and a privilege for me to be joining you tonight. Uh, at Cooperstown last week, I was at the uh, annual symposium on baseball and American culture. The paper that I presented was regarding the intersection of the careers of Alex Johnson and Tony Canigliero very briefly with the California Angels in 1971. And I mentioned that it could have been that Canigliero was suffering from, although certainly not diagnosed with, post-traumatic stress disorder after being hit in the eye in uh, August of 1967, getting hit in the eye and suffering a very, very long comeback. Uh, nobody has, uh, nobody I think has officially diagnosed it as, as such. And uh, certainly at that time, it was uh, not much of a factor. Um, I don't know if you could comment on that or think in, in terms of your own injury, if it was ever labeled specifically as uh, PTSD. You see this book here? Yes, sir. I wrote this book. I got a story in there about Tony Canigliaro. And it, it, is, it is, I said that I think that he suffered from a, uh, a, a, a brain, a traumatic brain injury. He got hit in the eye, the eyes right there at the brain. Okay. And he, you know, he has some issues. I bet you, if you talk to people who was close to him, who knew him, they would tell you some, some stories about him that would, 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 would probably make you think. I said something about Curry Puckett. 
Kerry Puckey got hit in the eye also. He got hit in the eye. And he had some strange behavior after, after he uh, you know, experienced this, okay? They both died at age 45 from an aneurysm. You believe that? They both died at age 45 from an aneurysm. What's an aneurysm? Brain? Mm -hmm. There's a correlation there. Yep. Okay. So you're not you're not far off. Tony Conigliere was a great player too. I used to, I used to like he he got one of the few Red Sox players I liked. I was a little kid when he was you know 66, 67. I was in I was uh, what 12 years old, 13 years old. He was he was a good player. Youngest to 100 home runs. Yeah. Very interesting story about Conigliere that I heard years ago. Tony C. <clears throat> excuse me, right before he had that heart attack um, in the car with his brother, had just left his final audition to be the color guy for the Boston Red Sox. This goes back to early, early, early 80s, the very first couple of years of Nesson. And apparently he, from what I understand, Paul shaking, was shaking his head yes just a minute ago. Paul, correct me if I'm wrong. It's my understanding he nailed that job then and was either offered it or was I were going to be offered the job, left the audition to be driven, I think, to the airport by his brother, got in the back seat of the car, massive heart attack in the back of the car, and, and apparently Billy raced to Mass General at, at top speed in a BMW. But the interesting uh culmination of the story and this goes to uh eric's uh project that's how jerry remy got the job wow was poor tony c was incapacitated for the rest of his life and remdog was next up uh, sure that, that asked yeah, that aspect of it, I didn't hear, and I don't know how long uh, Remy continued playing with the Red Sox after he was traded to Boston uh, from California, but uh, that that could be coincidental timing. That, that, that could be the case. I might have Apocrypha here right now, but it was my understanding that, that he and um, Tony C were the two finalists. Tony C was incapacitated. They gave it to Remy, and uh, Ned Martin worked with Remy for several years to get him comfortable on the air because if uh, there's any Red Sox fans here that remember Jerry Remy in his first couple of years, he was terrified to be on television and worked through that with a guy who, as far as I'm concerned, one of the best play-by-play -play guys ever in Ned Martin. Yeah, and, uh, and Coniglio did well out in San Francisco uh, for yeah. the time that he was a, as a broadcaster out there. Yep. But well, again, thank you, Rupert, though. very much for your story. Appreciate it. No problem. Uh, I, and you know what? It's amazing, huh? One story leads to another story to another story. <laughs> My friend Ben Abel. Ben, you're up. Everybody's your friend, huh? Yes, they are. You bet they are. Ben's not talking to me. Come on, Ben. Is that Ben in the corner? Yes, it I, is. I think he might have stepped away from the computer. I just oh, saw maybe him. Maybe he stepped oh. away. Okay. We'll come back to him in just a minute. Rupert, tell me about the process of writing the book. <clears throat> and uh, Dick Layden may want to come in here for just a minute, but tell me about the process of writing the book. How did you get started in this? And what was the metamorphosis for it? Okay. When I, when I finally connected the dots and I kind of understood what happened to me, you know, you know, the lady who I was seeing, my psych psychiatrist, she was saying how you got a story. You should write a story, write a book. And uh, I, I said, oh, that's a, not a bad idea. I didn't realize, you know, writing a book, of course, you know, I'm the kind of person that I'm gonna do something, I just go do it. Okay, I don't think about the ramifications. I don't think about the process or what, what's gonna go into it. I'm just gonna write a book. And I started writing the book. And I start finding, I start going, I start opening doors in my in my mind that had been closed for years. And actually, the book was very therapeutic. Okay, so if anybody wants to go through some 
go, go through some self-evaluation and they want to open some doors inside their mind that, that's been closed and locked, start writing, your, start writing your memoir and be truthful and be honest about it. And you will go places that, that you didn't believe existed. And then you will realize certain other things too. And as I was writing my book, I kind of had to stop for a little while, for a little while, because it was, it was, it was, it was getting me emotionally. You know, it was getting me emotionally. But I found the answers to why I wasn't always. I always wondered why I, I couldn't be as good as I wanted to be. And when I when when I when I understood the the head injury, that that guilt and that resentment and that whatever 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 emotion that is, it went away. Because I, I I look at myself and I realized that I played seven years after running to that wall and I was semi-decent. So, you know, I did have the talent to be better, but of course, in your case, Molly, you know, you, you, you would like to do certain things, but you just can't do them. Well, you're absolutely right, Rupert. I can't drive myself to school certain times of the year because of my vision issues. Well, how, how would you how would you like to know that you can't do something or you have a hard time doing something and you don't know why? It's maddening for me those times of the year. I mean, I know exactly why I can't do it. And it's I didn't it's know why maddening. I couldn't do it, Molly. I didn't know why I couldn't do it, Molly. Oh, I can't even imagine it. I can't. Okay. God bless. I couldn't. I couldn't. I couldn't understand why one moment I was. I was this, and the next moment I was that. Okay. And it was. It was like this ongoing, for years. I was. You know. So consequently, that was. That was. You know. That bothered me, and that. And, and that's something else I had to live with. But when I. When I wrote the book, and I started going through it, I start processing it. I start realizing. Okay. I'm, and I'm so to... sorry, man. Just as one human being to another, I'm so sorry that you had to ex go through that experience. Like that you just don't understand why things have changed. I'm 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 very sorry that you had to deal with that. You know what, man? I got a wonderful wife. And if you told me that I had to go through all that again to meet my wonderful wife. I would go through all that again to meet my wonderful wife. Oh my gosh, that's wonderful. Okay, you can be best. You can have you can have the best in the world, but you can have a bad wife. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I'm sorry, <laughs> but if you have a wonderful wife, that's that's wonderful. That's a, that's that, that's just that's fantastic. And you know, and I got hey, a lot. And also gave me for husbands too, huh? It also goes for husbands too, because Bruce was a huge part of my healing. Ma'am, that's because you're a wonderful wife. You, if you were a bad wife, you you might not have got what you got. I'm sorry, Bruce. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I just wanted on record here before we go any further. Rupert says he was halfway decent as a ball player. So 1,103 hits in his major league career, 147 home runs, an on-base percentage of 330, 22.6 baseball reference war. I think the call can agree that Rupert Jones was a little bit more than halfway decent in his major league career. Give it up for Rupert Jones here, ladies and gentlemen. Hey, help this me guy... understand something. Help me understand something. Go okay. for it. I think, I think you and I talked about this the last time. Maybe. They got numbers in baseball. I just don't understand that they, they don't make sense. Okay. Right. I mean, think about it. Mm -hmm. War. What is war? War is wins above replacement. There's actually two. What is it good for? Absolutely nothing. Thank you. Thank oh you. God. Okay. Think about this. Mike Trout got a great war number. His team comes in fourth, fourth place in their division. Yeah. What kind of wins above replacements is that? That's true. That's, that's wins above losses. Okay. Just I I do want it. I do want it on record here that Poole is antagonizing me now by singing, and 
Hold on now. I'm, I, I, I'm not saying Mike Trout's not a good ball player. Hold on now. I'm not saying Mike Trout's not a good ball player. Mike Trout's a great player. But what I'm saying is, you saying wins above replacement. His team's in fourth place. Ain't no wins over there. Yeah, uh, Dick Layton, did you ever, you wanted to uh, pop in on something too? You got to unmute yourself though, my, my guy. Yeah, okay. I'm now unmuted. Thank you. Yes, you are. Oh, uh, I, I am, I am so glad that you mentioned Kirby Puckett uh, in your um, references, Rupert, because that's a story that I have not been able to explain to my kids at all. Uh, now that they're even grown up. In 1991, we went to uh, spring training uh, in Florida and uh, the deal with my wife was, okay, we're gonna go to the beach one day, but we're gonna go to a major league <laughs> facility in the next day. And by far their favorite, my kids who were, were nine and 11, their favorite player was Kirby Puckett. Um, they and there were scores of kids that just followed him around, uh, and of course many of them were even taller than Kirby Puckett, though not as big as was, and and to see what happened to his life and how it unraveled, I just did not have an explanation until, I mean, that that whole possibility that it could have been it could have been a beating that that spiraled him into being somebody that uh, I I could not recognize after he left the after he left the major leagues. And see, that's the part that we don't understand. Okay. Yeah. You know, think about it. This is the head, brother. This is the head. Yeah. The eye is the head. Behind the eye is the brain. Okay. And he got hit in the he got hit. He got hit, hit serious. And it causes, you know, it, it, you know, it causes him some, some issues. And his personality changed. Uh, from what I understand, he changed his personality changed, and a lot of things happened. Yeah. Okay. So now you know you can tell your kids that. Thank you, Rupert. Thank you uh, very this much. This this has been one of the best meetings the chapter has had since we we were incorporated last uh, November. Uh, what else we got for Rupert? Anything else, guys? Rupert, uh, I had a question. Yes, ma'am. Uh, Donna, go first. I can wrap it up later. No, go ahead, Molly. It's fine. Oh, thank you. Rupert, so you talked about um, you, the fact that you had sleep issues. You've talked about the emotional regulation issues. Did you ever suffer with headaches or any other symptoms? I still get, my, my head still hurts from time to time. Okay, I've never, you know, I took, uh, I, I take, you know, I, I might take an Advil, but I don't take, I don't take too, I don't do too many, too many uh, other, I do supplements and I do Advil from time to time. That's about it. Uh, what I've, I found out is when you got head issues, drugs and alcohol is, 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 not, is not good medicine. They don't mix. Okay, they gave you barbiturates and I'm saying barbiturates. That's, that don't mix. That might, they gave that might, that at first, huh? yeah. Excuse me? They gave me. They gave that to me at first. They got it off. They got me off that pretty quick. Did it help you? It might have helped you. You know, it, it might helped me temporarily. Um, but I do have uh, basically maintenance medicine I have to take every night for controlling the headaches. Okay. They tried to take me off of it this past winter um, because. I have a thyroid issue as well. Okay. And the medicine they originally put me on can ramp up my heartbeat. Yes. And my thyroid issue already increases my heartbeat. And when they went to go take me off of my headache medicine, it went really bad. And it also um, caused me to have anxiety issues. So they, my headaches were out of control. I missed school for like three days. And I suddenly have developed anxiety issues because I've been on this medication for like five years. Right. I was on medication for a long time too. And I, you know what? You, the key word you said was maintenance. 
Yep. Five years of maintenance. You know, I'm yep. you know, I'm yeah, I'm it becomes pretty tiring. So you you know you have to sometimes you got you gotta take some 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 personal some personal uh, uh measures and try different things. You know, you could well, try meditation. Medication down to a very low dose now. Cause I've been going can to you meditate. Can you meditate? I do meditate. Um, but the chiropractor honestly has done better for me than anything else. <laughs> I know I missed my chiropractor. He retired a few years back. I missed my I missed my chiropractor. But yeah, he's done wonders. They um the original neurology team didn't notice that I had a whiplash injury from the second concussion. So that went undiagnosed until uh just this past year. And I started treatment for that this past fall. So I had a whiplash injury that was never treated. So with that being treated and having, you know, semi-regular sessions with the chiropractor, I was able to get my maintenance medicines down very low. Yes. Good. Yeah. And you may have to just keep trying, you, you may have to just keep trying on your own with certain things. Okay. Yeah. You're not waiting for the you keep waiting for the doctor and he don't know nothing. Because he can't experience what you're experiencing. Oh, yeah, I know. Okay. But he might say, well, you shouldn't have that. You shouldn't have these symptoms or you shouldn't be experiencing that. He can't speak for you. Oh, I know. Trust me. I'm really good at sending those. You know how like most doctors these days have like that app you can talk to through a <laughs> channel? I don't Trust talk me, to apps. I'm real good at that when I'm on my lunch break at school. I don't talk to apps, ma'am. I don't uh, talk to apps. I don't talk to I don't talk to machines. I don't talk to apps. No way. Well, there's literally one cell tower in the town that I teach, and it goes down and forget the phone. Where do you guys live? So we live. So if you look at a map and find the town of New London, New Hampshire. Okay. You follow the route 114 south and I teach in a little town called Bradford, New Hampshire. Okay. And it's very rural. We've had alpacas on our campus. It's a 25 acre campus. Um, alpacas have broken out of the local farm and we, the principal and the custodian have had to round them up before. We've had bears on campus. We've had moose on campus. It's very rural. It's beautiful. And it's a tiny little building with 150 students. 150? Yep. I'm an intensive needs para for a one-to-one -one student. And I deal mostly with behavioral issues. What kind of behavior issues? Um, it can vary. Um, I've dealt with kids in the past who are self-injurious. I've dealt with aggressive children. I've dealt with just non-compliance. So it depends on what I get for an assignment. So you have a talent then. Yeah, I've done this for a number of years. I also volunteered um, as a Special Olympics coach when I was younger um, for track and field. And I was the smallest and youngest coach and I had the most aggressive and um, challenging men to work with. And I you took them to the state games. You got, patience, you got patience too. So consequently, you, you, know, you, don't, you don't have anger issues because you, it's, it's, it's kind of hard to be people like that and have anger issues. No, I don't. I never had the anger issues that you've Good. described. Good. Excellent. Uh, one of the things I found out too time. is a lot of times people with head injuries, they are left with a talent. They are left with some kind of talent. Molly's is putting up with me. Uh, let's go to Don. <laughs> oh. <laughs> uh, hey, Vassie, don't, don't encourage the woman. Come on. I saw that. Gotta go. <laughs> it's a great transition how you're talking about somebody with a traumatic brain injury being left with a talent. Because my question to you is if you're familiar with the story and the work of Lauren Taylor. Lauren Taylor. Nope. Familiarize me. Lauren Taylor is a sports artist who suffered a traumatic brain injury that was should have been really apparent from the beginning, if you see the pictures of the way she went to the hospital, but she was sent home and told basically take aspirin for the pain. Yeah. And um, 
she had to advocate for herself um, and did and is still dealing with, I can't tell you how many surgeries later and, and dealing with anxiety and a lot of stuff, but she found peace and solace in art and now is um, a becoming a well-known sports artist. Um, and she also does these things called gratitude projects where if somebody was an inspiration to her, she creates a, a piece of work about them and tries to deliver it to them just to say thank you and say what you're doing is an inspiration for me and others. And and I, I think the two of you would, would really hit it off and have a lot to talk about. She has a talent. And you know what? You said something about gratitude. Uh, gratitude is something that I, uh, I talk about in my book, more or less. But I call the people who were very good to me in my life and the people who were in my, in my life at a certain time that helped me get through a certain portion of my life, I call them angels. Okay? I call them angels. And I, you know, and I had a few, you know, I talk about the angels in my life you know, a lot. Okay, because you know, I didn't you know before I wrote the book, I didn't even think about it. But as I was writing the book, I realized these people were very important. And without these people, I couldn't have, I, I, I may not have gotten through that portion of my life without that person. Okay, so yeah, gratitude is a very gratitude is, a, is, is, is an emotion that we, 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 you know, we need to be, to, to be able to express, not just because you got a head injury, anybody should, anybody should express gratitude. Because gratitude basically is is is, is, an, is is the emotion that you help the other person by let by helping them realize, hey, you were very inspiration in my life. You helped me. Well, thank you for being an inspiration to me. Well, thank you very much. Ken Edwards, you there? I see his name. I am. I there he is. I Go am on. here. Yeah, I just I wanted to. Um, how come we can see your face? Hold on, hold on. How come we can see your face? <laughs> uh oh, you got called out by Rupert Jones. There you go. I'm right here. Oh, the Seattle Mariner, Seattle Pilots. Okay, come on. I I'm multitasking. I I simply I simply wanted to, um, to reiterate the importance of the message that you are sending to us, that whatever whatever adversity we have, it's so important that we continue to overcome it no matter where we are in business, in family, in health. It's so applicable. And I just wanted to thank you for saying, for inspiring. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate that. Uh, because basically, we can't get through life without adversity. There's no way you gonna get through here. There's no way. The day you stop having emergency is the day they bury you. Okay? Everybody, everybody understand that. The day you stop having emergency is the day they is the day they bury you. Last one for tonight is going to be Paul. Paul, take us home. Thank you very much. Uh, just a, a, a trivia question of sorts and then a quick comment. Um, Rupert, I, I have a recollection. I did not cheat to look this up. Uh, Yankee Stadium, 1987. You're with the Angels, I believe. Uh, Saturday matinee at the stadium against Ed Whitson. And I have a recollection. You put one in the upper deck against him. Is that, am I remembering correctly? You remember that? When you soon you said that, I said, he's going to talk about that home run I hit in Yankee Stadium in the third day. <laughs> oh, good. It's funny okay, how so I can remember. I, it's, it's funny how I remember things like that. <laughs> okay, so I do have a good recollection. I like. Oh, that. I hit one. I hit one in third deck. And and uh, just just a closing comment that uh, your your experience and things that you've been sharing here remind me of a quote that was attributed to Robin Williams saying that everybody you meet is fighting a battle that you know nothing about. Be kind always. Robin Williams, one of my favorites. Okay, uh, he has some issues. A lot of comedians, a lot of comedians use humor, okay? They use humor to, uh, to combat the issues that they live with. 
Just a little trivia there. If you notice, a lot of a, a, a lot of comedians are trouble trouble individuals. Uh, Robin Williams drank for years, I heard, and then went, and then he stopped drinking. And he stopped drinking for about for a few years, and then he started back, and he started back where he left off. Was, you know, I haven't drank in thirty two years now from alcohol free for thirty two years. Uh, but I made a promise to God that I was uh, that I would not I, I would I wouldn't I, I wouldn't if I make it I said God if I make it through the night I'll never drink again, and I made it through that night and I never drank again. I made three promises to God. I made that that, that was the first one. I made I, mean, I, I made a lot to him. I should say I made a lot to him. I only kept three, and the three I kept was if I if I make it through the night I'll never drink again. I kept that one. When I started writing the book, I said, Lord, I'm, I'm going to write a book and I'm going to finish it. It took me five, six years to finish it, but I finished it. And then I said, I'm going to get it published. If I, if I couldn't get the help of a publisher, I'll do it myself. And I ended up doing it uh, you know, with, with the help of you know, some, some good people. Don't get me wrong. You, know, you need help when you, when, when you do things. So I got it published. All right. I kept those three promises to God. And thank you for sharing your story. It's very important. Thank you. You're more than welcome. People got to understand. And like, you know, like, you know, you guys talked about Donnie Moore, you know, how Donnie Moore, you know, you know, but hey, we don't get to the World Series with, you know, we don't get to the playoffs without Donnie Moore. See, that's another way you got to look at it. Some guy mentioned Gene Mark losing games in a tough situation. Gene Mark managed a lot of times. He, he managed a long time, so he must have been pretty good at what he did. Okay. Success, you know, what is, you know, people, people's idea of success sometimes gets, gets distorted. Okay. Think about your definition of success. Achievement, pride. Well, you could be successful in a negative situation. Okay. Look, I, I've used Molly for, for a situation. Molly has, She's had some challenges, but she still goes to work and she teaches kids with special issues. Okay, that takes a lot, man. It takes a lot to teach special kids and then you got your own issues you're dealing with. That's even tougher. The ladies, uh, what's, your, uh, I'm, uh, what's her name again? She talked about Lauren, Lauren, uh, what's, what's Lauren's name? It was Donna. 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 Lauren Taylor. Lauren Taylor. Okay, she got some issues. She got some things going on, but she found the talent in those issues, and she using those, she used that talent. Okay, the one guy mentioned Curry Puckett. He, you know, he he wondered what happened to Curry Puckett. Why his person? You know, why why he changed? And then I, when I told him what what may have happened, his view of Curry Puckett changed. What he thought of Curry Puckett changed. We always look at the cover, but we don't look at the, what's on the inside. You gotta look on. You gotta look on the inside. Hey, before we go, Heather, did you have a question? I saw your hand. Was that a question? Well, I wanted to follow up on what Rupert had just said about Donnie Moore and um, G. Mock and the idea. My feeling is that this may be a little controversial, but I think that the the Stathead community is largely responsible for this mentality of of like pitting uh, players against each other and saying, this guy is the best and this guy is the second best and this guy is gonna go to the Hall of Fame and this guy isn't gonna go to the Hall of Fame. And it just gets to be really, I noticed this discussion, this type of discussion happens a lot where they wanna dismiss somebody completely because they suck. Yes. You know? Yes. Think about like Nolan Ryan. Game or Think about Nolan Ryan. Be some, something, that I, I have uh -oh. a problem with, you know, involved with these players. You know, they don't understand and like what goes on in their in their lives. And, and to be to add that little tidbit to come. You're breaking up on oh, oh my yeah, I think we just lost Heather there, I hate to say, but she, she makes some very good points. 
what's the, what, 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 I wanted to, I wanted to kind of hear what she had to say because what she was saying was very, very, very enlightening. Let me see where you had her. You still there? No. No, I don't think she is. I hate to say. Uh, Rupert, I actually you, Heather wanted. You hear me to... now? Oh, there she goes. Rising <laughs> up now. I hate to say it, uh, Rupert. I want to say Heather wanted me to put uh, her in touch with you because she wanted to discuss a part of her of a book that she is is working on with you, um, uh, about Mark Little. So, uh, Mark she... Little. Mark uh, Littell. Littell, sorry. Mark Littell. Big country boy, Martin, Kansas City Royals. Yep. Right. You I don't know that much about Martin. You. I, I can't help you. I don't so know that much I, about him. But you. All right, poor Heather's having a little trouble tonight. So we'll. Uh, yeah, tell her, her, tell her I can't help her. I have some now, so. Yeah, tell her I can't help her because I don't know that much I about Martin. I will. Yeah. I'll put her in touch with you offline, but. This has been fantastic. Ladies and gentlemen, give it up for Major League, former Major League Baseball All-Star Rupert Jones and his phenomenal story of overcoming adversity and never giving up. Rupert, you are a fantastic person. You were, don't let anybody fool you, you were better than just some middling baseball player. Come on, man. You were a great ball player who represented your teams spectacularly over the years you've overcome a ton of adversity i admire can the I tell a story can i tell a story, you I tell a story so before you leave can i Is tell that? a story before you guys leave yes okay it's in the book 2012 you know this is this is after i've connected the dots and everything and i've gone through and i found out what's happening i start i'm doing research and everything and I run into I, my wife and I, I tell my wife, I met my wife in 1997. And I talk about Nolan Ryan a lot with her. So now fast forward 15 years later, we at the airport in Austin, Texas, and Nolan Ryan is in the security line, TSA line. I said, Susita, baby, they go Nolan Ryan, they go Nolan Ryan. She said, where? I said, that's Nolan Ryan right there. So I go up to Nolan Ryan and said, Nolan Ryan, Rupert Jones. And he looks at me like he don't even know who I am, right? Never heard of me. So now my wife is looking at me and she, she's kind of, mm -hmm, she's kind of embarrassed for me now. So we walking around the security line and he got to me and said, you hit a home run off me. I said, that was 30 years ago. He said, I'm still mad about that. <laughs> I said, don't worry about it. I said, oh, that was the first hit I had off you in two years. And we started laughing, of course. But yeah, when 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 he told me that, I I, I you know, I kind of like, okay, I was I was decent, wasn't I? You were. I hit a home run off Nolan. I, I actually two home runs off Nolan Ryan. Right, there you go. But he struck me out about 18 times though. <laughs> he struck me out <laughs> about 18 <laughs> times. This is just this has been great. Hey, 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 all right, hey, check, hey, check this out. All right, you talk about negatives and positive. I got two home runs I've known around I won't talk about, but it, he struck me out about 18, 20 times. <laughs> he remembered the two home, but he remembered the home run I hit off of it. Nice. Okay. You turn your successes or you turn your negatives into positives. <laughs> love it. I love it. Rupert Jones, I appreciate you so much. Thank you so much for doing this this evening. This has been the, the best presentation we have had since we've been incorporated. Thank you so much. Next week, ladies and gentlemen, we will have John Kosis with us. He's going to be discussing his new book, Play by Play from the Miners, Profiles of Baseball Broadcasters from Scranton to Yakima. Same bad time, same bad channel. You will see those links go out in, in our Monday message next Monday. Don't forget to join us. Rupert Jones has hey. been awesome. Yeah. This has been Thank great. You, Rupert. Thank you, Rupert. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thank Have a great you. night. We'll see you again next week.